Today we are doing physics 062542 Feb March 2021 paper. Question number one. Part A says figure 1.1 shows a piece of glass of thickness this 2.0 cm and area of this. The density of the glass is this and we are given with the area and thickness. Part A says calculate the weight of the piece of glass and this is for 3 marks. So what we can do is we know the formula weight equals mass into gravity and we are, we are not given with the mass so we have to find mass but instead we are given with area thickness and density of the glass so what can we use here is we can use density equals mass divided by volume and to find out mass we can do as density into volume equals mass we have the density which is 2.6 into 10 raised to 3 kg per meter cube and we can find out the volume by multiplying area and the thickness. So we will have 0 0.15 into 2.0 into 10 raised to the power minus 2 because we have to convert this into meters. This is in centimeter. So 0 0.15 into 2.0 into 10 raised to the power minus 2 which is going to give us our answer as 3 into 10 raised to the power minus 3. So this is going to be our volume. We have the density. So what we can do is just multiply them. 2.6 into 10 raised to the power 3 into 3 into 10 raised to the power minus 3, which is going to give us our answer as 2.6 into 10 raised to the power 3, 7.8. So we have 7.8 as our mass, which is going to be kg. Now to find out the weight what we can do is multiply by the gravitational constant here which is 10. So 7.8 into 10 is going to give us 78 Newton. Part B says the piece of glass shown in figure 1.1 is used as the vertical viewing window of an aquarium. The atmospheric pressure outside the aquarium is this. The average pressure on the inside of the aquarium window is this. Calculate the resultant force acting on the window due to these pressures and state the direction in which it acts. So what is happening here is we have an aquarium and our vertical viewing glass is this one. And this has an area of 0 0.15. Now what happens is uh, imagine we have an orange liquid inside this container. And this is exerting pressure of 1.3 into 10 to the power 5 because it says this is inside the aquarium. And from outside, what is happening is we are getting atmospheric pressure, which is 1.0 into 10 to the power 5. Now, to find out the force on the glass, what we can use is we can use the formula change in pressure equals force divided by area. We have change in pressure, we can just find out by subtracting this with this and area we have is 0 0.15 and we can find out the force so for finding out change in pressure what is it what is it going to be as 1.3 minus 1.0 into 10 raised to the power 5 i just took out 10 raised to the power 5 as common and subtracting 1.3 with 1.0 and this is going to multiply with area which is 0 0.15 and this is going to give us our course so we can just use our calculator here it's going to be 1.3 minus 1.0 into 10 to the power 5 and then again it's going to multiply by 0 0.15 which is going to give us our answer as 4.5 into 10 to the power 3 into 10 to the power 3 so we can write our answer here 4.5 into 10 to the power 3 newton because force is in newton and it asks the direction of the force. Now, how do we find the direction of the force is we can just put a hole in the aquarium. If we have a hole in aquarium, the water is going to burst out. The orange water is going to burst out. This is how we find out the direction of the force. Because when there is a hole in the aquarium, the water goes out. So the force is outwards. That's why we have to write the answer as outwards.
if you try this at home if you have a glass and you fill it with water and you put a hole in the glass what's gonna happen is the water is gonna move from inside the glass to outside so that's how you find out this and you get full marks for this part c says figure 1.2 shows a vacuum pump connected to the top of vertical tube with its lower end immersed in a tank of liquid the pump reduces the pressure above the column to zero and the pressure at point x is this we're given the height it says calculate the density of the liquid so we're given with height and we are given with the pressure and we're supposed to find the density here so the only formula which relates this is pressure equals h rho g where this is gravitational constant this is density and this is height we have all of them what we can do is just equate and make density our subject so it's gonna be density equals pressure divided by height into gravity so pressure we have is 9.6 into 10 raised power 4 9.6 into 10 raised power 4 divided by height is 12 and the gravitational constant is 10 so we can just put this in our calculator 9.6 into 10 raised power 4 divided by 12 into 10 and it's going to give us our answer as 800 and we can write our answer here 800 and the units will be kg per meter cube either you can write like this or you can write like this both of them are okay they're correct and we are done with question number one question number two part a1 says state what is meant by moment of force about a point so this is just a simple definition and you have to learn this to keep on asking the same question again and again and we can just memorize that it is turning effect about a point and we get one mark for this part 2 says figure 2.1 shows a large crane on a construction site lifting a block of mass 14,000 kg calculate the moment about a due to the mass this block is suspended from B so the formula for moment is force into perpendicular distance so this perpendicular distance should be from the pivot and we can see here that our weight is this which is gonna be 14,000 into 10 because this is mass and this is gravitational constant and we multiply them to find out our weight and our perpendicular distance is gonna be this because it has 90 degree angle in between of them so that's how we find out moment we have force we have perpendicular distance we just plug in our values and we get our answer so our force is gonna be 14,000 into 10 and then into perpendicular distance which is going to be 20 so we can just use our calculator here into 10 into 20 which is going to give us our answer as 2.8 into 10 raised power 6 so we can just write this here 2.8 into 10 raised power 6 and our unit is going to be newton's meter Part B I says speed is a scalar quantity and velocity is a vector quantity. State the difference between a scalar quantity and a vector quantity. So uh, it's pretty simple definition about this as well. Scalar quantity has only magnitude and vector quantity has magnitude and direction. So we can write down here. As magnitude and direction and we'll get two marks for this part 2 says write down one other scalar quantity and one other vector quantity so scalar quantity as you know is only magnitude so we can write mass here any example mass and for vector quantity I'm gonna just write similar to mass which is gonna be weight because mass doesn't have any direction and weight has direction which is downwards part C says figure 2.2 shows two forces acting on an object and you can see here there's a 13 30 Newton force 
and 20 newton force and there's an angle between these both which is 60 degrees so the question says draw a scale diagram to determine the resultant force acting on the object state the scale you use so first we're gonna state the scale in this case we are going to use as one centimeter equals five newton and this is going to be our scale so 30 divided by 5 is going to give us 7.5 and 20 divided by 5 is going to give us 4 so for this we can just draw the diagram so this is going to be 4 centimeter and the angle between these both should be 60 so this should be 60 you have to use your protractor and this force which is 30 newton is 7.5 centimeter so now to find out the resultant force what we have to do is see the direction of the force if the direction of the force is opposite we have to draw using our compass and protractor so uh, what we can do is we can use our compass which is like this or you can see the image on the side we have to use this and first measure this distance and use it here draw a line like this and then after this what we have to do is measure this distance with your compass and then what we have to do is draw a line here on this side like this and what will happen is we will get our resultant force from here so we can just draw a dotted line and connect this first and this is going to be our resultant force and if we measure this this is going to be 10 centimeter so our answer for the resultant magnitude of resultant force is going to be 10 into 5 because we took 1 centimeter as 5 newton so it's going to be 10 into 5 which is 50 newton and we can write down here the other part says direction of resultant relative to the direction of 20 newton force so our 20 newton force is here on this side you can see here 4 centimeter and what we have to do is we have to find the angle between these both so the angle between these both is 40 degrees so we can write 40 degrees and if we go here on this side it is anti-clockwise so we can write here 40 degrees anti-clockwise so 40 degrees anti-clockwise from 20 newton force and we are done with question number two question number three a power station burns waste materials from farm crops to generate electricity. Part A says state and explain whether this process is renewable and give a statement and explanation. So our statement is going to be yes. And the reason why it's going to be yes is that crops can be grown again and then we will get the waste materials again and again. And it's just endless cycle. So it's a renewable method. So we can just write down that here crops can be grown again and waste material can't run out and we'll get this for two marks one mark for statement and one mark for explanation part b says the power station uses some of its waste thermal energy to heat water for houses in a nearby town state one problem of using waste energy in this way if the power station is far from town so what will happen is when you're transferring the water let's imagine this is the pipe what is going to happen is when the water is transmitting there will be some loss of thermal energy and if the distance is more what will happen is the water will cool down and eventually all the heat will get lost during the transmission so we can write down here that thermal energy will be lost during the transmission the same question says suggest a way of reducing this problem 
So what we can do is we can use poor conductor of thermal energy and we can transfer the waste from there. So transport waste and poor conductor of thermal energy. And we'll get two marks for this. Part C says state two environmental consequences of burning coal to generate electricity. The first of course is gonna be that carbon dioxide is released, so CO2 released. And what will happen is because of this we will have global warming. Contributing more global warming. And the second consequence is that it's not a renewable energy method. So eventually we'll run out of coal. Not a renewable method. And we are done with question number three. Question number four. Part A says, in terms of momentum of molecules, explain how a gas exerts pressure on the wall of its container. And this is for four marks, so we just have to explain what happens. So first we have molecule. We can visualize that here. Imagine we have this molecule here. And this goes and hits with the container. Just goes and strikes with the container. And what happens is that it changes its direction. Now when it changes its direction, we have the formula momentum equals mv. As the direction changes, velocity changes. And the reason is that velocity is a vector quantity. It's not a scalar quantity. So it depends on direction as well. So as the velocity changes, the momentum increases. So we can explain this in our words. Molecules go and hit the wall and after that what happens is the momentum changes as velocity changes so we can write here momentum changes as velocity changes they are asking us explain how a gas exerts pressure on the wall because of the momentum and the reason behind this is that we have the formula pressure equals force divided by area and we know that force is change in momentum change in momentum and as momentum changes the force also changes and we know that pressure is directly proportional to force as force increases pressure increases because they are directly proportional so we can mention our last point here that as change in momentum increases pressure increases and we'll get four marks for this part b says a fixed mass of gas of volume v1 is at pressure p1 it is compressed to a volume of v2 part i says Complete the equation for the final pressure P2 of the gas when the gas is compressed at a constant temperature. So we know the formula that P1 V1 equals P2 V2. And we can just make P2 as a subject. So we move V2 on this side and we get P1 into V1 divided by V2 which is going to give us P2. And this is going to be our answer for this. Part 2 says state and explain how the final pressure compares with P2 when the temperature of the gas increases during compression. So we know that temperature is directly proportional to kinetic energy and as temperature increases, kinetic energy increases and because kinetic energy increases, the velocity also increases. So our statement is going to be increases. And the explanation we can give is that as temperature increases, kinetic energy increases. And as kinetic energy increases, the molecules hit container's wall more frequently. Increases, the molecules hit the wall more frequently. And thus what happens is there is more change in momentum.
momentum. We'll get three marks for this and we are done with question number four. Question number five. Part A says state the name of the reflection of a sound wave or ultrasound wave. So that's going to be echo, very common sense. Part B says figure 5.1 shows an ultrasound wave being used to scan an internal organ of a human. There's a ultrasound transmitter and receiver, ultrasound wave, and internal organ. The ultrasound wave has a frequency of this megahertz and passes through human tissue at a speed of this. Calculate the wavelength of ultrasound wave in human tissue. So to find out wavelength, we have to use the formula V equals F lambda. We know V, which is here, and we know F, which is in megahertz. To convert this into hertz, what we have to do is 2.0 into 10 raised to the power 6. And this is going to be our hertz. So to find out wavelength, what we have to do is rearrange our formula. So it's going to be 1500 divided by 2.0 into 10 raised to the power 6. And we'll get our answer for our wavelength, which is going to be 2.0 into 10 raised to the power 6. And our answer is going to be 7.5 into 10 raised to the power minus 4. And don't forget the unit, which is going to be meters. And we'll get three marks for this. Part C says figure 5.2 shows crest of a wave from a point source S approaching a straight line barrier. This is the source and you can see here the straight line barrier as well. Part I says or in figure 5.2 indicate and label one wavelength. Part 2 says on figure 5.2 draw three crust of the wave reflected from the barrier. So this is pretty simple and one wavelength is going to be this which we can write it as lambda. And for the reflected wave, what we can do is we can just follow these things, these points, and we can draw our wave. So it's going to be like this. And make sure the distance between these all are same. So this is going to be our reflected wave. And we are done with question number five. Question number six. Part A says figure 6.1 is a full scale diagram showing a converging lens. The two principal focuses F1 and F2 and an object PO. On figure 6.1, draw two rays from point O of the object to determine the position of the image. Label the image IJ, measure the length of the image. So what we have to do here is just draw our normal two rays. One is going to go from the middle of the converging lens here. And it's going to pass through the focal point. Now next what's going to happen is as the object is in between this path what's going to happen is it's going to be a virtual image. So what will happen is we will have one more ray which is going to pass here from the center of the converging lens like this and it's going to go till here. Now to find out the virtual image what we have to do is just trace this back here like this and here is going to be our image ij and if you find out the length of this it's going to be around 3 centimeter so we can just write here 3 centimeter and it's going to be our answer Part B says ring three descriptions of the image. We have many options here, diminished, magnified, real, same size, same way up as the object, upside down compared to the object or virtual. Now you can see that image and the object are both on the same side and they have same direction. So we have to circle this same way up as the object. And as this is magnified, you can see here the object is way smaller than the image. So it is magnified. And we can project this on a screen because it's same way and magnified. We can just project this on a screen. So this is a virtual image. 
Part C says figure 6.2 shows three rays of green light passing through glass blocks. Three rays of red light approach the glass blocks on the same path as the ray of green light. On figure 6.2, draw the path of these ray of red light to the right of the glass box. So what we have to do here is just draw our red light and you can see here we are given with two prisms and we have our table which is red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet. So what will happen is as this is green right this is green which is here and we have red which is the second ray. So what's going to happen is as you go from V to R there will be less reflection and the reason is because the frequency is less. So as you go from here till here the frequency and the reflection decreases. So what's going to happen in this case is we can just draw here that red light will come here and touch the prism and what's going to happen is the reflection will be less compared to the green one. So it's going to go here. Same will happen here. As it touches the prism, it's going to go and the reflection is going to be less. So it's going to go and hit here. The same thing will happen for the middle one, but the middle one is not going to get reflected because there is no angle of incidence. So it's going to go like this. So our point X, if we take this as point X, what will happen is our point X will move towards here. This is all what you need for this part. And we are done with question number six. Question number seven. Figure 7.1 shows a horizontal conducting wire XY between two opposite magnetic poles. Wire XY forms a circuit with an ammeter. Part A says explain why the reading at the ammeter is zero when the wire XY is not moving. So what happens is that here there is no wire so the magnetic field is not cutting anything. It just moves from this plane area where there is no wire. So that's why there is no cutting of magnetic flux. That's why we write here no cutting of magnetic flux. And we get one mark for this. Part B says the wire XY is moving and there is a deflection on ammeter that indicates that there is a current in the wire from X to Y. And it says that table 7.1 on table 7.1 tick one box to indicate the direction of the movement of the wire XY and explain your answer. So here they have mentioned that the current moves from X to Y from the ammeter. This is the tricky part in the question. It says on the ammeter it is like this from X to Y. So it's like this from the ammeter perspective and what's going to happen is when the current flows from the wire it's going to change its direction when it passes through the wire here this wire. So that's why what we have to use is use our Fleming's left hand rule and we're going to have F B I where F is going to be our thumb, B is going to be our index finger, and I is going to be our middle finger. And when we put our middle finger here on this direction, and the magnetic field here on this direction, which is going to be our index finger, what will happen is we'll get our force upwards, and that is to the top of the page. So we can tick our option here, which is top of the page, and the explanation we are going to give is that the current flow is opposite on top compared to the ammeter. And we'll get three marks for this. One mark is going to be for ticking, one mark for explanation, and one mark for the arrow. Part C says, state what is observed on the ammeter when the wire XY is moved in the opposite direction to the part B. And part 2 says, in the same direction as part B but greater speed. What will happen is, when you change the direction of this, the force changes downwards. You can use your Fleming's left hand rule again and you can find out that. 
So what happens here is when you change the direction of the wire x y the current is in opposite direction. And what's going to happen is the force is going to go to the bottom of the page. Part 2 says that the same direction as part B but at a greater speed. So what will happen is there will be greater current and the ammeter is going to deflect more. So we are done with question number 7. Question number 8. Part A says define electromotive force EMF. And this is pretty simple definition. You should have learned this before. Energy needed to drive unit charge. And we'll get one mark for this question. These type of questions you should have learned it before the exam. And memorize these definitions because they tend to repeat definitions again and again in like every year. Part B says figure 8.1 shows a source E of EMF 60 in circuit. So we can write here 60 so we don't forget about this. The heater has a resistance of this and the potential difference across it is, is this. Calculate the power of the heater. So we are given with the resistance and we are given with our potential difference. And we are supposed to find power. The formula for power is P equals IV. But we're not given with current. So what we can do is use another formula, which is V equals IR. And we can make I as the subject, as we don't have I. So it's going to be P equals V square divided by R. And this is going to be our formula, which we are going to use here. We have the potential difference, which is 45. So it's going to be 45 square. And the resistance is 22.5. And when you put this in our calculator, we'll get our answer as 90. We can write our answer here, 90 volts. Part 2 says calculate the potential difference across resistor X. So we know that both resistors have same potential difference because they're parallel to each other. They're not in series. So what's going to happen is that this is 45. And we have total of 60, so it's going to be 60 minus 45, which is 15. So both of them will be 15. So we can write here potential difference across resistor X is 15. And don't forget the unit. Part 3 says the current in the 10 ohm resistor, you have to find that. So here we have our resistance. And here we have our potential difference. So we can use our normal formula, which is V equals IR. We have potential difference as 15. And we have resistance as 10. So we can find out our current, which is going to be, if we make I as the subject, 15 divided by 10, which is going to be 1.5. We can write our answer here, 1.5 ampere. And we are done with question number 8. Question number 9. Part A says write down the truth table for an OR gate. This is pretty easy. OR gate is only going to give 0 when both inputs are 0. So we can just write out truth table here. Input A and B. And this is going to be our output. And when the inputs are 0, the output is going to be 0. But if either of the inputs are 1, the output is going to be 1. And this is going to be our table for our gate. Part B says draw the symbol for an OR gate. And this is also pretty sa standard. We have two inputs. And this is normal OR gate. And there's going to be a circle here because it's a not OR gate. And this is going to represent our NOR gate. We get one mark for this. Part C says figure 9.1 shows a digital circuit designed to produce the values shown in table 9.1 for the output S from the two inputs P and Q. There are inputs P and Q and we are using a NOT gate here and there is a gate X. Part I shows the table and we have to complete this so we can just complete this here. For output R which is here we have input of Q which is here. And we, as we're using NOT gate, 
our output is going to be opposite of input so it's going to be one zero one zero and this is pretty much for one mark another part says that state which type of gate is used for x explain your answer we have to give a statement and give our explanation as well so they're asking for gate x which is our output s and the inputs are p and r so you can compare the inputs here and you can see the only condition where the output is 1 is when both inputs are 1 which is here so this tells us that this is an AND gate and the reason we can write or explanation we can write is when both inputs are 1 the output is 1 and we get 3 marks for this question we are done with question number 9 Question number 10. Part A says state the proton number, nucleon number, and the value of charge on an alpha particle. So we know that alpha particle has four nucleons and two protons and two electrons. So what's going to happen here is it's going to be two protons and four nucleon number, and the charge on it is positive two. It's going to be plus two. And we get three marks for this. Part B says a nucleus of strontium 90 consists of 38 protons and 52 neutrons. Strontium 90 is radioactive and decays by beta transmission to an isotope of deuterium. The symbol for strontium is SR and for symbol for this is Y. Write down the nuclear notation for this decay. So what we have been given in the question is that strontium decays and the products are beta transmission and our y which is ethereum so we can write here that sr decays and what happens is it emits beta particle and our y and as we know beta particle has nucleon number of zero and the charge is minus one so what's going to happen here is our sr has 90 nucleon number and our proton number is 38. To get 38 on this side, what we have to do is we need 39 on this side. And 90 is going to be the nucleon number because 90 plus 0 is 0. And 39 minus 1 is going to be our 38. So this is going to be our nuclear notation. And we get 3 marks for this. Part C says the half-life of radon 220 is 56 seconds. A sample of radon 220 is in a container. After this much time, the mass of radon is this. Calculate the mass of the original sample. So because of the half-life, what will happen is the mass will decrease over time. And uh, we know that half-life of radon is 56 seconds. And we keep it out for 112 seconds. So we can find out how many half-life does radon goes through. For that, what we have to do is divide that time with 52 which is going to give us 2 point something 112 divided by 52 which is going to be 2.15 which is approximately 2 so what happens is there are two half lives involved so we have to multiply 9.2 with 2 2 times if it were 3 then we would multiply 9.2 into 2 3 times so this is how it happens so what's going to happen here is 9.2 into 2 into 2 because we have 2 over here if it was 3 we would multiply this by 3 times 2 so it's going to be like this so in this case it's like 2 times 2 so that's why we can just write it like this and 9.2 into 2 into 2 is going to give us our answer as 36.8 and this is equal to 37 approximately equal to 37 and we can write our mass here as 37 milligrams because the unit of this is also milligrams and we are done with this paper hope you understood everything if you have any com any questions or any comments you can write down below i'll try to respond as soon as possible till then see you in the next video bye bye